Okay, welcome everyone to the May session of the Health Law and Ethics Network seminars. Um, I'd like to start, as we always do, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where the University of Melbourne sits, and that is the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kula Nation. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so today we've got um, a really interesting talk that I'm very excited for. It's by Professor Julian Savalescu. Um, Professor Julian Savalescu has held the Hero Chair in Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford since 2002. He has degrees in medicine, bioscience, sorry, medicine, neuroscience, and bioethics. And since 2017, he has been visiting, he has been a visiting professional fellow in biomedical ethics and group leader for the Biomedical Ethics Research Group at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and Distinguished International Visiting Professor in Law at Melbourne University. At the University of Oxford, he directs the Oxford U Hero Centre for Practical, Eth Practical Ethics within the Faculty of Philosophy, um, he co-directs the Welcome Centre of Ethics and yeah, yeah, the Welcome Trust Award on Responsibility in Healthcare. So he's a very, very busy man, as you can see, and we're very, very lucky to have him speaking to us today. Um, about the use of AI in IVF. So Julian, do you want to share your screen and start your talk? Thanks very much. Um, so in the middle of the pandemic, I was approached by um, an IVF clinician who, who knew me from the UK, who was practicing in Beijing, um, Masood Afnan, and asked me if I'd be interested in, in having a look at um, the use of artificial intelligence in IVF that was being rolled out. And he was being concerned, he was concerned that, that this was being prematurely adopted um, with, with possible consequences to patients. And, and together with Yanni Louie, an embryologist from uh, Monash IVF, uh, who, who's in Queensland, um, they'd been looking at um, some of the, the models that some of the AI um, models that had been used and were concerned about uh, inflated expectations. So I contacted Vince Conitzer, who I was working with, a computer scientist at Duke, and he brought in Cynthia Rudin, um, who is um, an expert in interpretable AI. And this, this paper is, is the result of, of the work that we've done together, looking at, at AI for the use um, of selecting embryos in IVF. But it's really paradigmatic of, of the use of AI in medicine. Um, and so I, although it's, it's a very narrow area, the problems that we'll raise are really generic for, for AI. Um, so whilst IVF gives hope to hundreds of thousands of couples each year with infertility, only approximately 25% of embryos reach um, live birth. Increase, increasing the success rates per transfer could shorten the time to pregnancy and lower the cost of treatment. More importantly, not every couple persists with treatment after failed transfers, even in the presence of remaining frozen embryos. So improving embryo selection may increase the overall live birth rate for some couples um, who would otherwise not continue treatment. So the goal of using AI in this context is, is simply to get a live birth. Some of you will be familiar with some other of my work, um, the, the, um, the theory of procreative beneficence, the, the moral obligation to select the best child. And I can, I can see great opportunities for, for artificial intelligence together with um, uh, whole genome analysis to select not just embryos that are more likely to survive, but embryos that will create children who are less likely to have common diseases through polygenic risk score selection. Um, but, but also have more advantageous traits like intelligence um, or longevity. So while this isn't the subject currently of, of the use of AI, the reason why I was partly, was partly interested because I could see the potential for this to, to develop. Um, and so AI uh, can be used to um, improve embryo selection. Um, and it's based on, on snapshot observations of the embryo being cultured over the first five days. Time-lapse videography um, captures far more images, one every five to 15 minutes than previous forms of imaging the, the, um, the embryo. And this has enabled 
embryo morphokinetics to play a much greater role in embryo selection. So with the advent of this data also comes the promise that AI um, can exploit it to improve embryo selection. The specific type of artificial intelligence that would be helpful for embryo assessment would be machine learning, which gives rise to models that can automatically learn and adapt as they are exposed to more data, whether images or other data. So why could machine learning be better for embryo selection? Firstly, computers can process vast quantities of data such as those generated through time-lapse imaging very quickly, where such a task would be too laborious for humans. AI algorithms might be better at leveraging data to recognize subtle but important patterns and therefore be better at selecting the embryo most likely to implant. Furthermore, embryologists often disagree with each other when assessing embryo appearance, signifying a high degree of subjectivity. An algorithm's evaluation could be much more objective. So there's a lot of promise for the use of, um, for the use of AI in embryo selection. Um, however, um, based on a review of, of Medline, Embase and Google Scholar, um, we failed to find any studies currently completed which evaluate the clinical effectiveness of an AI tool for embryo selection. But there have been many efficacy studies which evaluate the accuracy of models on retrospective data for two types of outcomes, predicting pregnancy or live birth uh, and agreement with the embryologist evaluation. Some algorithms were shown to broadly differentiate well between good and poor quality embryos, but not between embryos of similar quality, which is the actual clinical need. Now, in addition, the vast majority of algorithms were black box or uninterpretable. Uninterpretable models are either too complicated to understand or are proprietary, in which case comprehension is impossible for outsiders. In the IVF context, these outsiders include doctors, embryologists, and patients. Um, we see several concerns with using black box models for this task, and we split these into ethical and epistemic concerns. The most uh, significant ethical objection that um, with clinical, implement clinical implementation is the lack of randomized controlled trials. Um, and these would be an absolute prerequisite for uh, clinical implementation. So I actually contacted the TGA to, to attempt to to find out what trials had been done. And, and I discovered that actually these are not classified as devices or drugs. Um, they're classified as software, as decision aids. So regulatory bodies such as the TGA don't require randomized controlled trials of artificial intelligence because in theory, doctors can deviate from them. They're, they're seen to be purely advisory. But in practice, um, it's likely to be the case that many doctors will defer to them, particularly when they have very uh, impressive um, measures of, of accuracy, such as their area under the curve um, of, of over 90%, where 100% where is perfect. And many of these had, had AUCs of 0.9, um, which, which were, were really spectacular. Um, but in addition to the lack of randomized controlled trials, black box algorithms override um, the shared decision-making process of doctors and patients who would have no choice but to accept or reject the algorithm's recommendation with any, without any consideration of its reasoning process. Another disadvantage of hidden reasoning process in black box AI is that such a model may select for certain characteristics such as male or female sex or even age of the patient, which might be uh, on, on the um, embryo <coughs> images. Um, uh, unbeknownst to the patient. And this selection may not align with patient values. Um, so for example, if there's a bias in favor of selecting either male or female sexed embryos, um, this may not be what, what patients want. Um, these biases could also impact society by also causing population gender imbalance. Well, I think this is unlikely. I think the concerns are much more vivid when it comes to more fine-grained embryo selection over large numbers of traits, as I described, using polygenic risk scores for disease susceptibility or, or advantageous traits. Finally, it's unclear um, who is responsible if it becomes evident that an algorithm makes poor choices for embryo selection. This is a familiar problem with AI uh, and, and locating uh, responsibility. In my view, um, 
doctors should be made responsible for the use of, of AI and, and held ultimately responsible. The treating clinician um, should be assigned responsibility. Black box AI also uh, raises a number of epistemic concerns. Um, most obviously there's an information asymmetry between the companies who sell the tool and their data and the embryologist who need to decide which embryo to transfer. This makes algorithms difficult to trust. This is especially problematic because confounders, which, gen which reduce the generalizability of an algorithm, are rampant and can easily be missed in evaluation. Furthermore, if an algorithm has a faulty reasoning process, this is very difficult to, to, to check before errors occur. There, there are now um, second order AIs which provide a justification for the decisions of black box. Um, black box uh, AI, but these are again, are very experimental. The economics may be unfavorable to IVF clinics too. A model's ability um, may only be guaranteed when treatment conditions perfectly match experimental conditions. This could force IVF clinics to purchase specific equipment, perhaps from one supplier to guarantee success. And lastly, troubleshooting and fixing an algorithm's recommendation is difficult when you can't understand its reasons. Um, so why would interpretable artificial intelligence be better? Uh, an interpretable AI algorithm, one whose decision-making process could be easily understood and communicated, could address some of these concerns. We could more easily identify biases in the decision-making process. The algorithm's reasoning process could be used as an aid to clinical decision-making and the responsibility for the decision remains clearly with the clinician. Combined human plus machine performance could be evaluated in a combined arm of a randomized controlled trial. Confounders would become apparent as would altogether erroneous reasoning process. And clinicians could modulate their interpretation of an algorithm's recommendation after different clinical, after different conditions, leaving IVF clinics less susceptible to economic evaluation. So um, our recommendations are that we should use replica, uh, replicable interpretable machine learning tools uh, and data. Um, we should have well-designed and conducted randomized controlled trials. Um, we should have post-implementation surveillance and we should have regulatory oversight requiring interpretable AI whenever possible. Funding to transparently develop and evaluate machine learning models, procedures for maintaining data security while permitting um, ethical data sharing, um, fully informed consent to use AI, and inclusion of patient values into AI programs where possible. Open access to code enabling participation from the broader AI community and training in AI for clinicians and embryologists. Um, so, uh, you know, although this this talk has been about AI, it raises a problem which I've been increasingly interested in, and that is the role of confidence in medicine. So the problem with, with AI is uh, in the use of embryo selection is, as I mentioned, um, what, what has in, in one very influential study, um, um, researchers showed that AI um, had the ability to predict good embryos rather than poor em embryos with an accuracy of 0.9. Um, but the issue is that embryologists are very good at predicting the difference between poor and good quality embryos. What you want is from a range of apparently good quality embryos um, to be able to predict which of those is going to be the most likely to, to implant. So your confidence of doing that using a model that was um, trained on differentiating between poor and good quality embryos is, is relatively low. Even though you have a spectacular AUC of 0.9, actually when it comes to what you need to do, um, it's, it's your confidence that it's going to be able to do that is, is much lower. So another recent example of this, um, of this issue was a, a, a sort of scandal in the IVF industry of a, a non-invasive um, test predicting chromosomal um, abnormalities in embryos, which had very spectacular 
um, or, or appeared to be as good as pre-implantation uh, genetic testing, uh, an invasive form of, of testing of the embryo, um, and, and was, was, didn't involve removal of the cells, so, so it was clearly preferable. Um, and although it, its predictive value was, was equally good, it turned out to be inferior, um, and, and partly because the, the, there was no peer-reviewed study, there was no randomized controlled trial, and just spectacular predictions um, based on looking at retrospective data. Uh, so again, you, the confidence that you would have that that kind of study would generalize out is very low. So um, I, I've been, been interested in this, this issue of confidence. Another example is the, the role of, um, or the, the use of the, the rollout of the vaccines, both the AstraZeneca and the, um, and the Pfizer vaccines. These were, were done on trials of 15,000 people um, who, um, which when, when you're going to give these vaccines to millions of people are relatively small trials. And on the basis of these trials, these vaccines were said to be safe, but you wouldn't predict um, side effects at the rate of one in 100,000 or one in a million, such as the, the rate of, of brain clots from the AstraZeneca. So you had a level of confidence um, in the safety, but by no means was that confidence high for popula population level rollout. And so in addition to doctors informing um, patients of, of the options, the possible outcomes of those options and the probabilities of, of those options, which are basically the elements of informed consent, um, I believe we need to attend more to the level of confidence in those probabilities or in those outcomes. Um, and so I've coined this acronym co-op or cooperation with the patient. So it's not, it's not just important to tell a patient that you know, there is a 70% chance this will be a melanoma. It makes a difference whether it's you know, a 70 to 80% chance or whether it's a, a 50 to 90% chance. So in some cases where you have a, a skin lesion where there is no downside to its excision, getting the probabilities tightly, tightly aligned is not that important. But when it comes to something like prostate cancer screening, where there is significant morbidity to intervention, the level of confidence needs to be made much more explicit. So we don't necessarily need accuracy. What we need is confidence. And I think the biggest chat, well, one of the biggest challenges that the AI in embryo selection raises is how do we get greater levels of confidence? Now, the classic way of, of increasing confidence around probabilities and outcomes um, in medicine has been the randomized controlled trial. And that's why I've argued that it's essential that we do randomized controlled trials, or it, it's highly desirable that we do randomized controlled trials of these new interventions, treat them like drugs or devices. But you might say that's overly demanding. There are some forms of AI which are legitimately decision aids. And I think the challenge there is to do, develop new paradigms of expressing confidence that enables um, pay, enable patients to make decisions um, based on their attitude to risk uh, and their own, their own personal values. So um, I, I think Alex Polikiev may be in the audience. He's um, the, the director of Melbourne IVF and, and they actually developed one of these black box AI tools. Um, and if, if Alex is there, he may have um, some responses. I understand they're now conducting a clinical trial into that black box AI, which is, which is highly laudatory. Um, but I, I think the, the biggest danger with AI is not bias. It's not um, transparency even. It's actually um, being able to be confident in its predictions um, in different ecological environments. And, and I think the challenge is going to be to develop new paradigms of, of assessing confidence and expressing it in the doctor-patient relationship. Um, so on, on, on the model of the doctor-patient relationship, there are traditionally a number of ways of thinking about the doctor-patient relationship. The original model was what was called the paternalistic model, where doctor knows best. The doctor 
recommends that you have this embryo or the doctor recommends you have this skin lesion um, sized and you acquiesce essentially. Um, so the paternal, paternalistic model was, was essentially that the doctor is like a father and doctor knows best. And this dominated thinking about medicine up until the 1980s or 90s. Around the, the 90s, this model of shared decision-making evolved. And there are a number of instantiations of shared decision-making, but on the most um, popular, the doctor provides information and the patient provides values. And um, so the doctor is a, an information provider and the patient chooses from a range of options in the extreme version, the consumerist model, like going to a shopping, shopping store and, and choosing an item um, based on their values. So in, in, this, in this role, the doctor is, is a technician that they provide information about, um, about for example, in this case, um, the nature of the different options around embryo selection and different ways it can be done and what their risks and benefits are. And then the patient chooses. Um, Zeke Emanuel described um, a deliberative model and, and I've described what I call a liberal rationalist model where the doctor is not only um, a fact provider, the doctor makes a judgment about what would be best for the patient given their values uh, and, and, and their autonomy and what would be uh, promote their well-being independently of what the patient may choose. And the, the doctor can engage in normative dialogue about different courses of action, making recommendations based on the patient's values. And on this model, it's critical that the doctor expresses confidence in the level of efficacy of, of innovative or experimental treatments, that they convey the level of uncertainty um, or certainty that, that attends um, the, the predictions so that the patient can most tightly match their values to different outcomes. Uh, and so, so on the liberal rationalist or the delivery of model of the doctor patient relationship, it's much, it's much more important that we know the limitations um, of the confidence that we have uh, in, in new interventions. So there are a number of other problems, as I described in the talk around the use of AI that interpretable, um, interpretable AI would, would address. Now, one of the, the commonest objection to the adoption of interpretable AI rather than black box AI is that interpretable AI is not going to be um, as powerful, is not going to be as predictive as black box AI. So you often hear that, you know, we, we, need, we need black box AI because it's going to have the best prediction of outcome. Cynthia Rudin doesn't believe that's the case. She believes that interpretable AI can do just as well as black box AI and has a number of epistemic and ethical advantages. And here, I'm open to the possibility that black box AI is superior. But I think what you need to do, as I've said, is treat it like a drug or device and do the clinical trials comparing interpretable with non-interpretable with standard decision-making and see which actually does have a better outcome. So I think there's a moral obligation at this stage of the development of AI to do trials. And I don't think that they should be introduced purely as decision aids. I think the TGA is wrong. Uh, and I think, I think the TGA should change its recommendations. And I'm working with Jeannie Patterson to um, make some proposals on, on how regulation could be changed in the future. Um, but let me stop there and take some questions. Thanks, Julian. Um, yeah, Robert, um, go for it, Bob. Bob, Bob Williamson here. Um, Julian, I'm surprised to hear you sounding a little bit more negative than you did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you convinced me that when we had a choice between embryos, that it not only was an ethical good, but it was an ethical obligation to choose what you described as the best embryo the best embryo at that stage in terms of health. You may remember the sort of situation we discussed was one where a couple 
wanted to avoid having a child with thalassemia or cystic fibrosis. They had several embryos that they knew would not develop thalassemia or cystic fibrosis, and they had full genomic data on each of those embryos. Is there any reason why they should not avoid using an embryo which, for instance, has APOE4, which is the major determining factor for Alzheimer disease, as against APOE3, which has a very low take of Alzheimer disease. Wouldn't you still say there's an ethical imperative both on the clinician and on the person who is uh, the couple who are involved to have the healthiest possible embryo all in all and to use all data available to achieve that outcome? Yeah, no, I've been, I've been writing on um, the use of whole genome analysis now to expand on what you just proposed. So not only could you look at APOE4, you could look at all the genes associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease and quite drastically reduce the chances um, of, of, of a future individual developing Alzheimer's disease. But it, it wouldn't just apply to, to, um, to Alzheimer's disease, it would apply to diabetes, hypertension, um, stroke, Parkinson's disease, all of the common diseases have varying genetic contributions. And now with the development of polygenic risk scores, where you can sum the effect of hundreds of genes to give risk predictions, you could use this to select the best embryo. In fact, genomic prediction creates a measure based on quality adjusted life years that would be maximized across a range of different common conditions for, for embryos. So, and you could use AI to augment this. And, and yes, I do believe there is an ethical obligation to use that if you can agree on the outcomes. So if you can agree on say the value of schizophrenia. Um, and so the, the, the problem is that in many of these conditions, once you move outside of something like thalassemia, which is a single gene disorder that you mentioned to polygenic conditions, you have a condition that's called pleiotropy, where one set of genes has multiple effects. So the genes that um, dispose to schizophrenia um, and manic depression also dispose to creativity. Um, the genes that are associated with higher IQ are also associated with autism spectrum disorders. So there is gonna be a difficulty, and this is the problem, a problem for AI, a, bar, a huge problem, is that AI will only maximize a value. You have to tell it what value you want to maximize. And so if you say, we want to maximize the number of, of qualities, it will tell you which embryo will maximize the number of qualities. But that's based on a set of assumptions about the trade-off between schizophrenia and creativity. And I might trade those things off differently. Now you mentioned APOE4, and I agree with you, I would probably say you don't want an embryo with E4. However, we don't know what the pleiotropic effects of E4 you know, may be. There may be advantages. And I agree, on the current knowledge, I would go with, with an E3 embryo. Um, but I think one of the problems for this is going to be disagreements about value. So the big one of the big problems with AI is that you have to... It's easy if you're just saying, what will prolong someone's life? Everyone wants to live a longer life usually. Um, but when it comes to complex trade-offs or contested values, then is the AI maximizing the value that the patient has? Um, or is it maximizing the value of the doctor or the developer of the AI or, or, or society? So I think that, that is also a big challenge for AI in the future, how to vi deal with value pluralism. Um, because when you say, yeah, it's, 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 of course we should have a better child, but then what's a better child? Some people with deafness say, deafness isn't a disability, it's a difference. So now we need to decide, well, are they correct? Um, you know, is, is value in the eye of the beholder? Um, or, you know, for example, intersex conditions. Is that something that we should screen out through, you know, embryo selection and, and AI should be programmed to, to, um, to select against it? 
um, those are questions that society seems very reluctant to address. Uh, and I think it's going to make it very difficult to use um, interventions like AI beyond very sim simple cases. Okay, so um, if anyone's got a question for Julian, you can either raise your hand with the chat function like um, Cameron just has done, or you can turn your camera on, raise your physical hand, and I'll see you and take a note of you, or you can put your um, question in the chat function. All right, so um, we've got a question from um, Cameron. Hi, yeah, really interesting talk. Um, now, off of what you were just talking about in terms of the decision-making process and how uh, values influence the information provided to patients, um, I'm just trying to visualize the sort of flow of values into uh, reasoning, into information, to back to the patient who's making the decision in order to um, like integrate the values into the um, information generation process. And I was wondering if you could sort of map that out for us from the perspective of your um, doctor-patient relationship model that you discussed earlier. Yeah, well, I mean, so take the embryo selection case, you know, if I were having IVF, um, you know, I would, I would want information around certain diseases and, and certain non-disease states. Um, and so I would want to be able to express those values to the doctor and not be told, well, this is the embryo that's most likely to, to provide, you know, a live birth. Um, I'm, I'm less interested in a live birth than a good birth. And so, you know, I think it, 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 ideally it would be that the patient can express their values about outcome and, and that's fed into um, fed into the AI that can then select according to that particular set of values um, or provides, you know, information around that's relevant to those values. But, but that's going to be difficult um, and, and going to require vastly powerful AI that's, you know, much more flexible than the current AI that, that takes a narrow parameter like live birth. Um, but I think that's the sort of gold, gold standard, really. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, and I think I was approaching the same conclusion myself that um, really it comes down to computational efficiency of the training. Because if you have a fast enough AI, then yeah, in principle, the patient could customize the AI based on their values. But yeah, don't have that uh, yeah. so I, I wanted to write this, um, this paper called Machine Paternalism. Because I think there is the possibility that these machines will become the new paternalists. So they will have a value that has been chosen and it will provide recommendations according to that value. But that's not your value. That's not what you most care about. And you don't even get a chance to express. Whereas with a doctor, you can say, well, hang on, you know, I'm not interested just in a live birth. I'm interested in a good live birth. Um, and, and, you know, and, 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 try to find out what course will, will. but when it comes to um, this area, there is a danger that um, there will be a new kind of paternalism where the values that are plugged into AI become the only values that are accessible to you, um, the only choices that are accessible to you. Is that Alex there? Yeah. So Alex, I'm not sure if you heard that talk, but I'm very interested in your response, but, but I think Pierre is next, but it'd be good to hear what you've got to say about this. All right, well, uh... Well, go Pierre, can go ahead, and I'll. I, I actually have a question as well. You should you should go first, Alex. If if it goes in. Uh, well, we, we are running a trial uh, of of black box AI compared to embryology selection, uh, and I I don't know the results. It's a randomized trial. It's double blinded, so we will see what what it will demonstrate. Uh, one of the concerns is that AI being artificial intelligence continues to learn on, on the data provided. And so one of, the, one of the issues, I suppose, is that the algorithm that is used today in the trial might not be the same as AI accumulates more data. And so I'm not quite sure how that would impact the result of the trial. I suppose the second issue is purely technical, and that is if you have a very good quality embryo versus very poor quality embryo, well, you know, it doesn't take an AI to decide which one you're going to implant. It's only going to be of value when embryologists are unsure. 
as to which embryo is looking better, I suspect. And so the value may not be as dramatic in, in terms of improvement of pregnancy rate per embryo transfer as people anticipate. We, we do have to remember that most patients have very limited number of embryos to choose from. And usually there is a, a clear winner rather than you know, all of them being wonderful. Uh, but that, that's just a side comment. Uh, when we talk about value... So, sorry, Alex, can I ask you a question? So then, sure. you know, one, one... And that I actually said a similar thing in the talk. Um, and obviously you're the expert. But so do you think at this point um, that, that the use of AI should be restricted to where um, embryologists are dis in disagreement around the best quality embryo? Well, I would have thought that it will sort itself out by itself, because if embryologists agree that one embryo is drastically better than the other, AI will most likely choose that embryo because it has, you know, in, in retrospect on all the data that we have available, that particular better embryo would have better chance of live birth. I mean, AI at the moment is only used to choose the embryo that would produce the best pregnancy rate. It doesn't actually take into account all the polygenic risk scores and all the other things that you're talking about. Uh, and so, yes, I suppose at the end of the day, that will be its place. And your concerns are, of course, very valid. But I must say that, you know, the worst case scenario is that it chooses a wrong embryo, but then it doesn't implant and you're left with the other one. So next cycle, you use the other one. So no, uh, no, that's not that's I mean, that's not the worst outcome. Um, the worst outcome actually is that it implants and has some kind of disability. Sure. Um, and so I think, or, you know, or it has a range of characteristics that's, that's biased, you know, in a way that affects yeah. society at, at a, a sort of broader level. So I think you're right. I mean, if it, if it doesn't take, then, then, you know, there'll be the chance for another image. It is, there's some downsides, but, but I think the, the issue that it could be selecting other characteristics yeah that are actually disadvantageous, I think is a real, and that's why you need surveillance that, you know, you didn't really have with IVF as well. Yeah. So I think again, you know, there's an, a, a moral obligation um, to follow up every birth from these new interventions like ICSI or like the use of AI mm. over time with big data to actually assess, the, assess what's going on. And we're in a position to do that now that you can assemble so much data. No, I, I totally agree. But my, my question is, when you talk about polygenic risk scores, and as you know, it's my sort of little area of interest, uh, we are basing our decisions on what's better and what's worse based on the data available today. So we think that Alzheimer's is terrible, but you know, prostate cancer, not so bad. And so the genetic prediction model that is used uses today's quality of life calculations to assess that. But obviously, these people that will be born will only encounter these problems in 50, 60, 70 years time. And so there is this veil of ignorance, so to speak. I mean, Alzheimer's could be treated with a simple vaccination for all we know. And look at the progress that's been made in the past 40 years. Imagine what it will look like in the next 50. I mean, I, I'm yeah, just so concerned that we value qualities in a, in a wrong way, we can't possibly imagine yeah, I, what I, it would I mean, be like. I, I did I did read this in your paper, and, and this is one point in which we disagree. And so, you know, here's my reason for disagreement. What you're describing is just a familiar problem of living in a probabilistic world. Yeah. Um, that you know, yes, Alzheimer's might be cured tomorrow, but so so might cystic fibrosis, thalassemia, Tay Sachs disease, anything. Um, and all you can do is make decisions with the information that you have available to you at the time. So that's what it is to be a rational agent, is to use you know, your ability. And of course, and, and I agree with you, I'm not confident that I'm going to be picking the embryo that's going to have the best life. And that's where I think confidence is important. But it's just, you have to use that to maximize the outcome given what you have available now and given we know alzheimer's is a bad disease and there are no treatments now and there's no there's no you know cure on the horizon there's a reason to select against it just as there's a reason to select against tay sachs disease so i i don't agree with you that the fact that it's in 50 years and things will change radically 
changes the nature of what we should do. It means that we can't be very confident about what the outcomes will be in 50, but we're slightly more confident that, you know, not having Alzheimer's disease is going to be better than, you know, having a gene for Alzheimer's disease. Now, it might not be as bad as we think now, um, but we don't have any reason to think it's going to be better um, at this point in time. So we've got a reason to select against it and no reason just to, to, to do it, to leave it to chance. So I, I, I slightly disagree with this. You know, I take your point that we can't be overconfident about the future, the distant future, but we, we can try to influence it. I very much agree with Julian on that. But there are real life examples. <laughs> for instance, as treatment for cystic fibrosis has improved over the past three or four years, fewer people are coming forward for prenatal diagnosis, whether at the embryo stage or at later stages. Um, so at the end of the day, there's also some level of input from the people who are most concerned and involved, those who are receiving the test data. Yep, I, I agree, Bob. All right, great. Um, Pierre's been um, sitting there very patiently. So um, do you want to ask you a question now, Pierre? No, no problem. Thank you very much, Julian. It's re really interesting topic. I was li liking so many of your keywords around paternalism, uh, regulation, transparency, explainability. Um, I really like that you mentioned that you are collab collaborating with the TGA to hopefully improve the regulatory framework that will have a lot of influence on this industry in the future. And I wanted to ask you what your stance on what I believe is a parallel when you mentioned the paternalistic doc doctor-patient relationship. Do you think this paternalism also exists in the regulatory institutions? And whether we should also work to impose to them the same explainability criteria that we want to impose to AI, because I found those processes to be unexplainable as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. Um, I, I think that's a very, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the role of paternalism in, in, um, at the regulatory level, but um, I actually have to give this lecture later in the year at the IAB, and I want to do some research into uh this kind of what i find outrageous so in this ivf example of the the non-invasive um embryo test it was actually un, uncovered by by monash ivf who got access to the primary data and then they identified problems with the primary data various exclusions um unblinded and so on and you know what i find outrageous is that we can't get access to the primary data that Pfizer um, had on, on vaccines. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a pro-vaxxer. I've had four vaccines. I'm always trying to get more vaccines. So I'm, I'm, this isn't an anti-vax kind of comment. But I think it's outrageous for an intervention that's been given to billions of people that we can't see the data. Only the FDA has seen the data or only the TGA has seen the data. And we're just meant to trust the TGA or the FDA. And you know, I, I, I think that's just not acceptable today. If, you know, if AI, you know, if companies developing AI should have to make their data available, which is what, you know, they should be, so should pharmaceutical companies who are marketing drugs and not just make it available to the FDA. And what you get in any peer-reviewed publication is not the primary data. Um, and so I think this is, this is um, it is a form of paternalism that we're meant to trust the TGA. And now there are so many people there in sort of citizen science who would be able to go through that data with a fine tooth comb and give us alternative interpretations or give us a, you know, another way of understanding it. And we're the ones taking the drugs. So I think you know, we have a right to that data. Um, and, and I think that's like a modern scandal that um, is exactly that paternalistic view that you know, they're the experts and they will decide for us. Well, I want somebody else to interpret it you know I want to talk to a number of experts you know and see and make my decision based on you know a number of interpretations not just one so-called expert thank you very much that's awesome and I'm, I'll contact you offline to discuss that further thank you very much
Yeah, well, if you contact me afterwards, I'll have to get your feedback on the paper when I write it. But I think it's a really interesting idea about uh, regulatory paternalism. So we've had um, a question put into the chat by um, Gur Post. So I'll try and um, I'll try and ask it for you, but feel free to uh, put the microphone on if you uh, want to take over. And I think it relates to the debate you're having with Alex about when we're considering what's best for an embryo, um, do we consider those things like, well, they're not going to have cancer for 50 years or 60 years, we might have a cure. And couldn't we sort of see now as rational sort of agents that we can see an improvement in medicine occurring? So I can think about these genetic sort of things and I go, oh, well, you know, looks like a lot of these genetic diseases, they're getting gene therapies for them. And I can sort of take that improvement into my decision making for uh, what IVF embryo I want. Yeah, well, I think that's a little bit like Alex's point, as far as I understand it, that medicine is improving. And we need to take that trajectory into account in our in our decisions, um, and 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 I I agree with that. You know, insofar as there's a likely trajectory, you should take that into consideration. But it shouldn't be just purely speculative. I mean, you you need. I mean, for example, I'm a big supporter of gene editing, but I don't see in the next ten years gene editing. You know being rolled out and having, so I wouldn't be saying, well, you know, um, it's not going to matter because, you know, gene editing will, will, will deal with it. Um, so I, I think it has to be realistic, um, you know, and, and again, calibrated for the confidence that you will be able to use that to influence, um, you know, the, the outcome. Is that answering your question? But yeah, I think it does. Thanks very much. I think it relates a bit to what, what information um, um, should be used in these sort of uh, decisions. Like where do you cut off the, where does it cut off the, the confidence? Yeah, yeah. like there's, a, there's an age old problem with information is that, mm. you know, when do you go to get more information and when, is, when do you have enough? And you know, generally when the opportunity costs of getting more outweigh the, the potential value. But that, again, forces you to guess on, on what the extra value is going to be. So it's the, the problem in medicine is not probability. It's uncertainty. It's, it's when you don't know what the probabilities are. You don't know what the values are. And I think this issue of uncertainty in medicine has just started to get its mind around risk which is when you know the probabilities. What it's really bad at doing is getting its mind around uncertainty. And we, were, we had this stem cell meeting you know, of innovative treatment, um, innovative stem cell therapy. And you know, innovation and research are questions of uncertainty. And, and there, you know, I think people should be able to take part in risky trials, you know, as long as you convey the uncertainty around those risks. Um, uh, and, 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 and the uncertainty of, of, of what they're doing. And I think this is a whole new area of, of, of um, medical ethics that, that I hope will develop. Thanks very much. I mean, I was, I, I, was uh, I don't know if I should say this. I don't think it really matters. Anyway, I was asked to, to be an expert, an ethics witness for a, um, for, for a, for a prominent doctor um, who was being sued for negligence. And they said to me, his team said, you know, what, what's your attitude to experimental therapies? And I said, I'm a great believer in the right to try. I think we should be doing more experimental treatments as experimental therapies. And we should, we should embrace much greater risks than we do now. Um, but first of all, the risks have to be reasonable. That is, they have to be proportionate somehow to the benefits. Um, but, but secondly, they have, the, 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 they have to be conveyed to the participant or the patient accurately with levels of confidence. But provided the person understands what the risks are, then they should be able to take them. Um, and they said, oh, thanks very much. We won't be needing you. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think that, it's, that that's an important part of the informed consent process. Okay, great. We've got um, a question um, from Michelle Taylor-Sands. Hi, thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks, Julian. Lots of interesting ideas. 
I guess one thing, I mean, you talk about the point of uncertainty, but and and sort of this notion of the of having a better child, and you do acknowledge that that's a very um, sort of value laden, contested values involved in that. But is that ever really a concept that you could ever get on top of beyond sort of, I guess, the threshold in that the NH and MRC guidelines have this concept of serious genetic disease? But beyond that, the um, I guess one thing you can never have or take into account is how you respond as a parent to a child that perhaps you didn't intend to have or whatever. And that has implications, not just as an individual, but also as a parent, but also as a community. And look, you know, that sort of brings into account things like the social model of disability, but there's such massive questions and such, um, there's, there's not really any answer to them. They're always going to be highly contested. Is it even useful or, or even possible to talk about this idea of something beyond, you know, what's really serious, considered a serious, which is in itself, I guess, also contested, but not as much as when you open the can. Yeah, of well, I think that people just fall in in one of two camps, a sort of postmodernist, um, relativist <laughs> sort of camp that you can't make any decisions outside of major diseases, catastrophic diseases. You know, these are just contested values that that you know are either incommensurable or um or or you know irresolvably in conflict and there are people and i'm one of them who take a more objective view that say you know there are certain things which are which are good for people and and certain things which are bad for people um and you know we can arrive at a at a at a decision that should guide society um, even if some people disagree. And, you know, for example, you know, one all purpose good is impulse control or ability to delay gratification. So the reason why 10% of children are on Ritalin is because if you don't, if you can't delay, you know, or, or, or forego a small reward for a bigger one in the future, you do worse in life. <laughs> you, you have less friends, less success, more likely to end up in jail. It's just bad for you to be um, overly impulsive, even if that's within the normal range. So that's, that's an example. General intelligence is another one. So you might say, and there are people who say today, well, Down syndrome, we shouldn't be screening for it because it's just a difference. Um, but in my, my view, general intelligence is like um, impulse control. It's an all-purpose good that helps you with, with whatever goal you have in life. Um, and, and the reality is that, you know, people are objectivists. I mean, that's how we create an education system. You know, it aims at, you know, realising certain um, goods in, in children's lives. Um, and, you know, if somebody said, you know, your child is, you know, th their IQ is going to drop from being normal to 60, um, equivalent to that of a, of a person with Down syndrome, you wouldn't just say, oh, well, that's a difference. So I'm, I'm not going to bother doing anything about that. You know, just like if their hair changed colour from brown to blonde, you would, you would go, well, it's just a change in hair colour. Um, so I think, I think we do need to move beyond this postmodern relativistic subjective view of value um, if we're to actually progress as a society. But I think this is the biggest crisis facing sort of Western um, bioethics and practical ethics. And there are, you know, most people, I'm in the minority, most people are in the diversity camp where, uh, you know, everything is of value to somebody. Um, and I, I think that's going to be deeply destructive to society. All right, we've got um, Bob with the hand and then uh, Simon. Yeah, uh, there is another aspect to this, Julian, which I think is important. Uh, when I was counseling mostly for thalassemia and CF, it was a choice of really either having that child or no child at all, which is one situation, or alternatively, terminating a pregnancy or not terminating a pregnancy. We've now, because of uh, pre-implantation gene diagnosis, we've now moved over to a situation where people have a choice between any one of two or three or four embryos, all of which they know will not be affected by the primary reason that the test was done. 
And in, the, in this situation, people, in my experience, become much more interested in discussing gender, in discussing intelligence, in discussing all sorts of issues, which previously, when it was a question of terminating a pregnancy, they weren't interested in at all. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got, if you have to make a choice, then, you know, it becomes a lot more legitimate to choose according to your values. So, you know, very few people are going to have a termination of pregnancy because their child is predicted to be, you know, at the short end of normal or at the low end of normal of, of IQ. But when they have four embryos and one of them is predicted to be at the short end of normal or at the low end of normal for IQ, why wouldn't you choose one of the others? Yep. And, and as you get more embryos, you'll have more of that choice. And with gene editing, you will have vast amounts of choice because there you could have a single embryo uh, and, and modify a thousand characteristics. So that's really, if that progresses, going to blow up choice in a, you know, in a profound way. And, and you know, people will vote with their feet, as you say. Um, you know, when it comes to most people won't, most people won't have a termination of pregnancy on the basis of sex, but when they have four embryos, they may be more inclined to, you know, um, family balance. Uh, and so there, but, you know, and the same will apply to IQ or to, to, to other characteristics. Um, and when you can do gene editing, that just means you can do it at a, at a vastly greater scale. And, and people will vote with their feet, I think. You know, I think we can say, you know, well, it's only going to be major diseases. But, you know, uh, if you look at people's behaviour, yeah. they will try and eke out every advantage for their child, um, whether it's through education or diet or, you know, extra coaching or whatever. And, and this will be, you know, a way of profoundly affecting that from the very beginning. Absolutely. I'm Simon. Oh, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> and thanks, Julian, for the talk. Um, just, a, just a question about black boxes, Julian. Um, it's um, uh, interesting you're doing that work with Jeannie Patterson on, on the TGA stuff. Um, do you think there might be a, a case for, um, for not allowing black boxes in the first instance, at least? Um, the, Cynthia Rudin um, has argued, of course, that, as you mentioned, that uh, we don't need them. Um, but if she's wrong, do you think there's still a case for, um, for stopping the use of, of black boxes, at least until a sufficient level of trust is built up in, in the use of AI in sort of high stakes decision making? Yeah, I think that one of the recommendations we made is that interpretable should be developed wherever possible in preference to, to, to black box. And that's her, that's her mission. She's a sort of <laughs> a kind of advocate of, of interpretable AI. I mean, I have a slightly different view to, to her because I think that you know, um, the past doesn't matter. Explainability doesn't matter in itself. So I'm a sort of heretic here. Explainability is just an instrumental value to predictability. It's just, you know, if you can explain something, you've got a high level of confidence that your predictions will be accurate, right? So, but if your predictions are accurate, it doesn't matter how you arrived at them. What matters is the future. And how you can change that. So I'm, I'm personally more open to, to testing the predictive value of black box against interpretable myself. I, I think it just, it's, let's see what works. And a lot of people are, are kind of, when they, it comes to AI, there are, three, there are three kind of phases of AI that ethics is relevant to. You know, it's what, what data you put in, what it does to the data and what outputs it comes up with. And actually the only important thing are the outputs and, and the justifiability of the outputs. You know, and so I, I, I'm not so fussed about the backward looking considerations. I think, um, I think that you know, we, we need to be more focused on this confidence in prediction and in achieving our values. And so, I'm all for I, what I wish that, you know, at what I want to get Alex to do is a trial of an interpretable AI against his black box AI. And then we can see if Cynthia's predictions are correct, or we can see what the value, the, the, the added value in intervening is. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of slightly more in the middle than Cynthia. 
Yep. But I respect she knows a lot more about AI than me, and and may and I'm, she's probably right. Thanks. Uh, Great guys, um, there is more questions, but um, we've sort of run out of formal time now. So what I might do is bring this uh, message to, uh, sorry, this uh, meeting to a close. I want to thank Julian very much. It was a classic Savalescu talk where we started about AI and embryos, we went to the meaning of life, all purpose goods, probabilities in life. It was really, really a great talk. So thank you very much. Um, and I want you to encourage you all to join us for the next Helen seminar. Um, in that seminar, Helen Douglas, Nicola Sheehan, and Laura Tazaria will be talking to us about reproductive coercion, the use of domestic violence, support workers, and lawyers. So we hope to see you all then. And yeah, thanks again, Julian, and goodbye all. Bye-bye.